Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is Mill Skills, an ongoing series of videos about learning how to use your vertical mill. Today, I'm going to talk about slot cutting. Now, if you are here because you want to cut slots and Google landed you here, but you don't have a milling machine, that's okay. I've got you covered. Skip ahead to this time index right here, and I'll show you how to do this with very basic tools. But if you do have a milling machine, stay tuned, and let's go. So what is there to know about cutting slots anyway? You put the material in and you plunge the cutter down, you run the table down to the other end and you're done, right? Well, okay, let's do that and see what happens. Yeah, before we do that, let's talk about which cutter I'm actually using. This is a two flute center cutting end mill, sometimes called a slot drill if you're British. And this is really the best tool to be using for cutting slots, which is I suppose why the Brits call it that. The center cutting feature is important. Here's an example of a non-center cutting end mill. This is a four flute, and you can see that the flutes do not meet in the center. So you can't plunge with this tool because the center of it can't remove material. You may also encounter end mills like this. This is a center cutting four flute, and you can see that two of the flutes do meet in the center. So you can plunge with a cutter like this, but four flute cutters are never great at plunging, so the two flute is still a better choice. One more just for fun, here's an exotic five flute, which might not look center cutting at first glance, but it actually is. You can see that one of the flutes extends all the way to the center axis of the cutter, and they've done some pretty exotic clearances around the other flutes to make that happen. But again, you really wouldn't want to plunge with this unless you had to. Where were we? Oh yes, we were plunging into this ratty old piece of steel. All right, down we go with this two flute center cutting end mill to start the slot. And that cutter is working pretty hard. More on that here in a moment. Now, once we've got through the piece, then I can lock the quill, engage the power feed, and away we go. The DRO is a big help here because you can note the starting position and the ending position of the center of the spindle at each end of the slot. Keep that in mind for some of the future operations that we're gonna discuss here. The size of slot that you can do in a single pass like this is very dependent on the rigidity of your milling machine and the material as well as the depth of slot. So this is a quarter inch cutter in eighth inch steel plate. And I think this is about the limit on this machine. I wouldn't want to try to do a single pass slot any more than this. Then I shut off the power feed, feed by hand up to the exact final position for the other end of the slot on my DRO, pull the spindle out, and there's our slot. That seems like a perfectly reasonable slot. What else could there possibly be to know about this topic, right? Well, you know machining, there's always more to know. Let's do a little deburring here and check our measurements. So this is a 250 gauge pin. That was a 250 end mill, so this should be a very close fit. And in fact, here in the middle of the slot, it is indeed an excellent fit there. So that's right on dimension. But if you look closely, see how there's a little bit of a barbell shape at the end there? Now look at the end of the slot here. Look at how loose that is. So the end of the slot is oversized. Here's a 255 gauge pin, 5 thou oversize, and that's a decent fit. So the end of the slot is quite a bit oversize. That's problem number one with a single pass. Problem number two is surface finish. Let's take a close look at that under the macro lens, and you can see how there's quite a bit of chewing up on that surface there. And of course, the end there where we plunged is also quite a disaster. So the surface finish is not going to win any awards here. Now, all that said, this slot is perfectly serviceable, and for probably 60% of slots that you're going to cut, this is all just fine. None of these are really huge deals. But let's say we want to do better. Well, we need to understand what the cause of these issues is. Let's look at surface finish first. That's down to essentially two factors. When the cutter is moving through the slot like this, you can picture that one side of it is conventional milling and the other side of it is climb milling. So there's a lot of weird forces going on on that cutter. For a deeper explanation of conventional milling versus climb milling, I recommend watching video number four in this playlist where I talk all about that. In addition to the weird differential forces on the cutter then, the other factor is simply the fact that it's doing a lot of work on a single pass like this. When you make the cutter remove this much material all at once, dimension and surface finish are always going to suffer. A way to fix these issues is to do three passes instead of one. After that first pass, I'm going to move the cutter over just a few thousandths towards the back of the cut and then I'm going to plunge down on the same starting position as we used before, and I'm going to pan back across the slot. Ideally, of course, you need to use an end mill that's a little bit smaller than the final dimension of the slot that you need to do this method, because, of course, we're now making the slot larger. 
But now you see that running across the back surface like that, we're only conventional milling. The other side of the cutter is not touching anything and we're taking a light cut. So we're gonna get a nice finish and we're gonna be on dimension here. I run all the way down to the other end of the slot. And now at the other end of the slot, I feed back to zero and a few thousandths the other way and feed back across. Once again, we're only conventional milling now and only one side of the cutter is touching the work. Once again, let's take a look at that surface under the macro lens. It's a little bit hard to show surface finishes on camera, but that is definitely much nicer. We can compare it to the previous one here. You can see how there isn't that sort of chewing up of the surface on the upper cut there. It's much smoother. That difference may not look like much visually, but trust me, you can absolutely feel it with your finger. The three pass method is much, much smoother. Now, of course, dimensionally, we've enlarged that slot. So the 250 pin is now loose in there. In fact, the 255 pin that previously would not go in now runs all the way down the length of the slot. So of course, mind your dimensions when you're doing this. But of course, we've also modified the geometry of this slot now. Here's our original slot here with nice round ends. But now look what happens when we run the cutter up a few thousandths and run it down the back side of the slot. You can see that in yellow, green there being the overlap. And then we do the same thing along the bottom. That pass is shown here in red. And now the overlap of all three passes is shown in brown. So I think you can see what's happening here. We've changed the shape of the ends of the slot. If I remove all the confusing colors here, this will be a little bit more clear. So here's the final shape that we end up with. And hopefully you can see that what we've done is technically squared up the ends of this slot ever so slightly. It's technically a rounded rectangle now, if you will. It's no longer a perfect pill shape like we had before. Now, the question is, does this matter? Most of the time, the answer to that is no, even if you're gonna have something round running in that slot. Here's a round pin, the same diameter as the width of the slot, and you can see when it runs up against the ends, there's actually only two small gaps here. The pin still has full three-point contact around the end of the slot, so even if you need something to be secure in the ends of this slot, odds are this is still gonna work. So our modification to the geometry of the ends there matters less than you might think it does, and most of the time, this is still gonna be fine. Back on the part here, if I run my gauge pin down to the end of the slot, you can't even see or feel the out of roundness there that's been created because again, that gauge pin has full three points of contact in the end, even though the end is slightly squared up now and no longer quite round. This effect can be a feature too. You can imagine running into the corners with a very small end mill like this and squaring them up quite a bit. If you need a square ended slot, you can get very close to that with small end mills like this. You can think of this as a first order approximation of squareness. Of course, you can never get perfectly square doing this. You have to use different techniques to get a perfectly square cornered slot. But again, in the real world, it's extremely rare that you actually need a perfectly square cornered slot, and this technique is likely to get you close enough. If you do need perfectly square corners, you can file them or broach them, or you can use a vertical piecewise technique like I demonstrated in my letter punch jig video. Now, what about that barbell shape at the end of our slot, where the end is oversized? That was caused by plunging the end mill directly into the work at full width. Again, because we're making the end mill work really hard, and frankly, end mills don't like plunging that much to begin with, the end mill is gonna vibrate and deflect, which causes it to cut slightly over size. However, there's an easy way around that. We just have to pre-drill each end of our slot. Using the same start and end position of the slot on the DRO, I'll do a second slot here with this technique. So once again, noting the start and end positions of the center of the radius of each end of the slot, that's key here. I'm going to center drill each of those, and then I'm going to drill through with a drill that's a little smaller than the end radius of the slot that we want. A good rule of thumb is the same as for reamers, which is one imperial size smaller or 1 64th. Then I'll come back in with the same end mill and do a single pass just as we did before. And already you can hear and feel the difference. The end mill is doing very little work now when it plunges down. And in fact, now we can do that with a non-center cutting end mill if we need to, because of course the drill has removed all that material in the center and the end mill has very little work to do on that plunge. Again, finishing at the same center point as we drilled at the other end using the DRO. Pull that out and that's a very nice looking slot. But now look at the magic. Here's my 250 gauge pin. Once again, very, very snug fit in the center there as before. But now when I move down to the end, same story. This gauge pin is a very, very snug fit. So this slot is exactly on dimension all the way down the length now. No more barbells.
That simple act of pre-drilling the ends made a huge difference there on dimensional accuracy. Let's say I had a part that was a few thousand smaller now that I wanted to be a running fit in that slot. You can see now that that part is going to run smoothly all the way up and down that slot. Whereas with the original slot with the barbell ends, this pin would get rattly and loose at the ends. A reasonable question then would be, why don't we just continue that drilling idea all the way down the slot? So let's do that. If you've just skipped to this point because you don't have a milling machine, this is called chain drilling, and it's a very easy way to also make a slot without a milling machine. We simply drill out the bulk of the material with a drill, and then file out the rest. These holes can be drilled with a drill press, or they can even be done with a hand drill. Now the secret here is to get the overlap of your holes just right. The ideal overlap is about one quarter the diameter of the hole. You'll see that the first two holes that I did there were a little closer together than that. I got a little greedy with the overlap. And you'll see the grief that that causes here in a minute. On the final hole where there's too much overlap, you can see the drill bit vibrating there and the drill does not stay on course correctly. It wants to deflect into the other hole that's too close to it. In fact, if I go slow-mo here, look how much that drill is deflecting and vibrating back and forth. So you need enough material between the two holes to keep the drill on course. Here's a closer look. These three holes in the middle here are ideal. They all have a one quarter diameter overlap. That's what you want. Over here on the end where the holes were too close together, you can see we've got a hot mess there. And in fact, that end is going to be oversized again. We're going to have a bit of a barbell there because that drill deflected so much. And of course, at the other end, this is not enough overlap, but that's always going to happen in at least one place because the length of your slot is never going to be a perfect even multiple of three quarters of your pilot drill diameter. But as before, make sure that you have a pilot drill right on the slot radius center at each end. But once again, let's mill this out and see what happens. So once again, I'm plunging at the end of the slot, which goes very well because I've got a nice pilot hole. Well, it's a hot mess pilot hole, but pilot hole nonetheless. And then I engage the power feed and run that down. You may not be able to tell here on camera, but the feed rate here that I'm using is actually double what the other slots were. The cutter is doing so little work here that you can go much faster. So this really does save you a lot of time, especially if you're trying to cut a large slot on a small mill like this where you can't take heavy cuts and using a drill to remove most of the material saves you a lot of time. And it also saves you a lot of wear on the cutter because effectively the cutter here is just doing a finishing cut. We're just taking those little peaks off of the drill holes. Surface finish wise, you can see that chain drilling helps quite a bit because again, the cutter is doing a lot less work. It's basically halfway between the single pass method and the three pass method. And dimensionally, this will be right on, just like it was with the single pass and pre-drilling the ends. I've been focusing on through slots until now, but let's talk about blind slots, because all the same rules apply, but we have an additional new wrinkle here, which is chip control. This can be problematic, especially on very high aspect ratio slots, which is to say slots that are much deeper than they are wide. Furthermore, you may have to manage depth of cut more, especially on a small mill. So I'm going to do a very deep slot here, and I'm going to do it in three passes. I'm also using aluminum this time to make this a little easier on my mill. So I do a single pass at one third of my final depth, but already you can see the problem. The slot behind us there is completely full of chips. So it would be nice to now plunge the cutter deeper and run back the other way, but we'd be running through this huge pile of chips here. And you don't want to recut old chips. That's hard on the cutter and it's bad for surface finish and dimension. So I'll clean that out with some air here and start to run back the other way. But you can see, again, the blind slot immediately fills up with chips again. If you have compressed air, you can keep it clear here to some degree. You can also use a vacuum for this, and cutting fluid helps a little bit. So if the slot isn't too deep, you can get away with these methods. But much deeper than this, and those methods start to break down. The ideal solution here, of course, is flood coolant. That's going to keep the slot completely clear as the cutter moves, but most hobbyists aren't going to have that, and it's messy. Here's a hobby-friendly alternative. This is Anchor Lube. Hashtag not sponsored, but it's an alternative form of cutting oil, if you like. I think it's soap-based rather than oil-based. It works quite well for clearing chips in a blind slot. So I just goop up the whole slot and the cutter with it, and now watch what happens on my final really deep pass here. 
It's a little bit hard to see on camera maybe, but what's happening is the anchor lube and the chips form kind of a lumpy paste that then allows the flutes on the cutter to lift everything up out of the slot as it cuts. The chips aren't piling up in front of the cutter at the bottom of the slot, which is what causes issues. They're all gooped up with the anchor lube, and so they just kind of float right up out of the slot. I'll wipe away the surface there so you can kind of see the end result. You can see that all of those chips were just sitting around the slot. The slot itself has almost no chips in it. In fact, if I blow it out here with some air, only a couple of chips were actually down in that slot. The anchor lube did a nice job of keeping it clear as it was cutting. Here's the final slot here. That's a 3 to 1 aspect ratio. It's three times deeper than its width, so that's quite a deep blind slot. Let's talk finishing now. For deburring slots, that can be a little tricky, but a standard Noga-style rotating deburring tool works quite well. Because of the pivoting action, it allows you to run down one edge, and then run around the end and run down the other edge quite easily. That does a pretty decent job. Most of the time, that's going to be sufficient. If you want to really take it to that next level, though, here's a nice trick. This is a chamfering tool. This happens to be a zero-flute chamfering tool, which are my favorite. So while the slot is still set up in the original setup where you cut the slot, using those same start and end DRO positions, just run the chamfering tool down in there. I'm feeding it down here with the fine feed until I get a depth that I like. And then I engage the power feed, and I run the chamfering tool down the length of the slot. Once again, finishing on the ending DRO position, which again is the center of the radius of the end of the slot. And then lift the cutter out, and we're done. This is a very easy technique, but you can see how amazing the result is. We get a really beautiful chamfer that follows the profile of our slot perfectly. This is the kind of feature that seems like it would be really difficult to create, but it's actually very, very simple. Now, if this is a through slot, you're probably going to want to do that to the other side as well, so you're going to need a method to locate the slot with the part flipped over, so something like an end stop would be helpful there. Well, there you have it. That's slot cutting in a nutshell. I hope you learned something useful in here, and if you've got slot cutting techniques that you want to share, put them down in the comments below, and we can all learn from each other. Thank you very much for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons who make all this content possible, and I'll see you next time.